Hi everyone! Today with Seti, we'll be exploring the nervous system. Together, we'll be adventuring through the different parts of the nervous system, starting with the brain, then the spinal cord, and finally discussing the different complex network nerves included in the system. So, are you ready to take a closer look at the nervous system with us? Great! Let's go! of the brain and spinal cord. The three broad functions of the CNS are to take in sensory information, process information, and send out motor signals. The CNS receives sensory information from the nervous system and controls the body's responses. The central nervous system plays a primary role in receiving information from various areas of the body and then coordinating this activity to produce the body's responses. The central nervous system, or CNS, comprises the brain and spinal cord. The three broad functions of the CNS are to take in sensory information, process information, and send out motor signals. The CNS receives sensory information from the nervous system and controls the body's responses. The central nervous system plays a primary role in receiving information from various areas of the body and then coordinating this activity to produce the body's responses. The brain and spinal cord make up the central nervous system, or CNS, which is the body's processing center. Both of these are shielded by the three meningeal membrane layers. The skull's hard bones provide additional protection for the brain, while the spinal cord is shielded by the bony vertebrae of our backbones. And lastly, cerebrospinal fluid, which acts as a cushion to lessen the contact between the brain and the skull, or the spinal cord and the vertebrae. The brain serves as the central nervous system's headquarters and the body's processing center. The forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain are the three primary sections that make up its general organization. The forebrain is the biggest of these three. It houses the thick cerebral cortex, the brain's wrinkled outermost layer, as well as smaller structures like the thalamus, hypothalamus, and pineal gland that are located closer to the brain's center. The vital connection between the forebrain and the hindbrain is provided by the midbrain. It is the section of the brainstem closest to the skull that joins the brain and spinal cord. The cerebellum, a little ball of dense brain tissue cuddled up against the rear of the brainstem, is located at the lowest back region of the hindbrain, which is also the part of the brain that contains the rest of the brainstem made up of the medulla oblongata and the pons. Now that you have a brief knowledge with regards to the brain, let us now get into it deeply. 
The cerebrum is about 83% of its volume and consists of a pair of half globes called the cerebral hemispheres. It performs higher functions like interpreting touch, vision, and hearing, as well as speech, reasoning, emotions, learning, and fine control of movement. The cerebellum is the second largest region of the brain. It constitutes about 10% of its volume but contains over 50% of its neurons. It is located under the cerebrum. It is the second largest part of the brain and forms a part of the hindbrain. The cerebellum has two cerebral hemispheres and the presence of a medial vermis. The white matter in this region forms arbor vitae. It forms a half circle shape around the brainstem, which connects the brain to the spinal cord and has a series of horizontal grooves from top to bottom. Lastly, the brainstem is like a relay sensor which connects the cerebrum and cerebellum to the spinal cord. It lies under the cerebellum, extending downward and back towards the neck. With this, let us go back to tackling the three primary sections that make up this general organization, starting with the forebrain. The forebrain consists of the diencephalon and telencephalon. The diencephalon encloses the third ventricle and is the most rostral part of the brainstem. The telencephalon develops chiefly into the cerebrum. It is the major portion of the brain accounting for two-third part and is considered the interior part of the brain, controlling the body temperature, urge for eating and drinking, memory, display of emotions, and regulation of sexual behavior. The forebrain is divided into three main parts, which are the cerebrum, thalamus, and hypothalamus, which will be discussed by Philbert Apuhin. The cerebrum. It is the seat of your sensory perception, memory, thought, judgment, and voluntary motor actions. It is the most complex and challenging frontier of neurobiology. The cerebrum is the largest portion of the brain and is made up of the right and left hemispheres, which are connected by a corpus callosum, a bundle of fibers that carries messages from one side to the other of the brain. It is located superiorly and anteriorly in relation to the brainstem. Each hemisphere is in charge of the body's opposite side. Your left arm or leg could become weak or paralyzed if a stroke hits the right side of your brain. It forms a part of the forebrain and unlike the cerebellum, the white matter does not form arbor vitae. For the thalamus, generally speaking, the thalamus is the gateway to the cerebral cortex. It is an egg-shaped structure that is located in the center of your brain above your brainstem. You actually have two side-by-side -side thalami, one in each hemisphere of your brain, even though it may appear to be one single structure. Being in this central location enables connections between nerve fibers to reach all regions of your cerebral cortex or the outer layer of your brain. The thalamus technically belongs to the diencephalon, a region of the brain that also comprises the hypothalamus, subthalamus, and epithalamus. Nearly all input to the cerebrum passes by way of synapses in the thalamic nuclei, including signals for taste, smell, hearing, equilibrium, vision, and such general senses as touch, pain, pressure, heat, and cold. The thalamic nuclei filter this information and relay only a small portion of it to the cerebral cortex. For the third main part, the hypothalamus, it is the major control sensor of the autonomic nervous system and endocrine system. It is about the size of an almond, which is located below the thalamus and above your pituitary gland. It sits directly above the brainstem at the base of your brain. This plays an essential role in the homeostatic regulation of nearly all organs of the body. Their primary function is to relay signals from the limbic system to the thalamus. The pituitary gland is attached to the hypothalamus by a stalk or infundibulum between the optic chiasm and mammillary bodies. The medulla oblongata or the medulla is the lowest part of the brainstem, found below the pons and above the spinal cord. There is no clear separation between the medulla and the spinal cord. Instead, the spinal cord gradually transitions into the medulla. Perhaps, the most important action linked to the medulla is the regulation of cardiovascular and respiratory functions. The medulla gets information about changes in blood pressure from baroreceptors, which are found inside blood vessels. This information is sent to the nucleus of the solitary tract in the medulla, 
which initiates reflexive actions to return blood pressure to a desired range. The medulla is also responsible for generating breathing movements and for regulating respiration to ensure there is enough oxygen in the blood. To accomplish this, chemoreceptors which are found inside blood vessels detect changes in oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the blood. When oxygen levels falls, neurons in and around the nucleus of the solitary tract and the nucleus ambiguous respond by increasing respiration. The medulla also controls a number of other reflexive actions like swallowing, coughing, sneezing, and vomiting. It is home to inferior olivary nuclei, which are connected to the cerebellum and involved in movement. It also contains the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus, important nuclei of the dorsal columns, medial lemniscus sensory pathway. A number of cranial nerve nuclei are also found in the medulla. The medulla contains a number of tracts that pass from the brainstem to the spinal cord and vice versa. The corticospinal tract and the corticobulbar tracts, important tracts for movement, form triangular bundles of fibers in the medulla that create ridges on the outside of the brainstem. The bundles and ridges have been termed the medullary pyramids, and because of these, the corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts are often referred to as the pyramidal axe. The pons is one of the major divisions of the brainstem. It contains a large number of tracts and nuclei. In this video, we will highlight some of the more notable of these. Pons is Latin for bridge, and it was so named because the anterior part of the pons, which is known as the basal or basilar pons, causes the pons to look like a bridge that connects the two hemispheres of the cerebellum. The region behind the basal pons is called the pontine tegmentum or dorsal pons. The pons contains many tracts and nuclei. The basal pons doesn't form a direct connection between the cerebellar hemispheres. But the pons is attached to the cerebellum by the middle cerebellar peduncles, a major pathway between the brainstem and cerebellum. The inferior cerebellar peduncles also travel through the pons to carry information to the cerebellum, and the superior cerebellar peduncles enter the brainstem at the level of the pons and carry information from the cerebellum to the brainstem. The pons forms most of the floor of the fourth ventricle and is home to several cranial nerve nuclei including trigeminal nuclei, which are involved with sensory and motor functions of the head and face, the abducens nucleus, which controls lateral movements of the eye, the facial motor nucleus, which controls muscles of facial expression, and the vestibular nuclei, which process vestibular information. The pons also contains the locus coruleus, the largest collection of norepinephrine containing neurons in the brain and some of the raft nuclei, the major serotonin producing neurons of the brain. The pons also serves as a conduit for many tracts passing up and down through the brainstem, like the corticospinal tract for voluntary movement, medial lemniscus for tactile and proprioceptive sensations, and spinothalamic tract for pain and temperature sensation. The midbrain. The midbrain is located in the center of the brain and measures around 2.5 cm in length. It is made up of structures that deal with movement, sleep and arousal, as well as visual, auditory, and tactile sensory input. This collects a large amount of information from the eyes and hearing and uses it to aid in the production of orienting movements. It is situated above the pons, ahead of the cerebellum, and underneath the diencephalon. The midbrain has two surfaces on the outside, the interior and posterior surfaces. The anterior view of the midbrain. The cerebral peduncles cover the majority of the midbrain's anterior surface. These are two enormous peduncles that contain tracts coming from the cortex of the cerebrum and are in charge of voluntary mo body movement. The posterior perforated substance is a depression on the anterior surface of the midbrain that contains gray matter as well as small holes, allowing blood vessels to enter and exit. 
Then there is a group called o Oculomotor Sulcus of Mesencephalon, through which the third cranial nerve, known as the ocul Oculomotor Nerve, emerges. This is known as the Oculomotor Nerve because it travels towards the eye to innervate the extrinsic eye muscle that allow the eyes to move. The posterior view of the midbrain. The tectal plate or lamina tecti are the most important structures linked with the posterior vision. Four spherical constructions can be found here. The upper two are known as superior coll colliculi and they are involved with quick and regulated eye movements. The inferior colliculi, which is part of the hearing pathway, is responsible for the lower two. The lateral sulcus of the mesencephalon, which is the border between the cerebral peduncles and the posterior surface of the midbrain, is another structure to look for on the posterior surface. The midbrain's interior surface. The midbrain's interior surface is separated into three areas. The midbrain tectum, which houses the colliculi. Then comes the tegmentum momentum of the midbrain, followed by cerebral peduncles. The cerebrospinal fluid is a colorless liquid that shields the brain and spinal cord from physical and chemical harm. It travels through the ventricles of the brain, the subarachnoid, and the central canal of the spinal cord. The function of the cerebrospinal fluid is that it creates an appropriate chemical environment for neuronal signaling, iron balance aids in the formation of action potentials. Next, physical protection or shock absorbing medium. This prevents bon bouncing of bony surfaces. Lastly, the nutrient exchange between blood and neural tissue. The choroid plexus, which are capillary networks in the walls of these ventricles, create cerebrospinal fluid. The ependymal cells of these capillaries that filter blood plasma to generate cerebrospinal fluid. Because of the tight connections between these choroid plexus epithelial cells, components to be filtered to make cerebrospinal fluid do not leak backwards here, which is known as the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier, which allows some compounds to pass through to cerebrospinal fluid. This is a method of safeguarding the brain and lowering the chance of contamination. Each brain hemisphere has four sections called lobes, frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital, having each lobe control specific functions. The frontal lobe is chiefly concerned with voluntary motor functions, motivation, foresight, planning, memory, mood, emotion, social judgment, and aggression. They are positioned directly behind the forehead. As the largest lobes in the human brain, the frontal lobes are also the most frequently damaged by traumatic brain injury. Within the frontal lobe lies the Broca's area and is also known as the motor speech area. If this area is damaged, one may have difficulty moving the tongue or facial muscles to produce the sounds of speech. The person can still read and understand spoken language but has difficulty in speaking and writing. This condition is called Broca's aphasia. The parietal lobe is involved in the perception of sensation, including touch, temperature, pain, and proprioception, as well as in the advanced perception of visual and auditory information. In general, the parietal lobe is involved in the following functions. Sensation of touch, information processing, 
cognition, spatial orientation, coordination of movement, visual perception, speech, reading, writing, and computation. The parietal lobe is the primary site for receiving and interpreting signals of the general senses. It rests slightly behind the frontal lobe and above the occipital and temporal lobes at the top and center of the cerebral cortex. The occipital lobe is the principal visual center of the brain. It is situated at the back of the brain, below the occipital bone of the skull, and behind the temporal and parietal lobes. The visual cortices are formed by Broadman areas 17, 18, and 19 in the occipital brain, while V2, VG, and V4, or Broadman areas 18 and 19, make up the visual association cortex, Broadman area 17 makes up the main visual cortex. The temporal lobe is concerned with hearing, smell, learning, memory, and some aspects of vision and emotion. They are the second largest lobe and sit behind the ears. The wernix area lies in the left temporal lobe. It is the region of the brain that contains motor neurons involved in the comprehension of speech. This area is important in the comprehension of written and spoken language. Damage to this area causes wernix aphasia. The individual may speak in long sentences that have no meaning, add unnecessary words, and even create new words. They can make speech sounds, however, they have difficulty understanding speech and are therefore unaware of their mistakes. The insula is less understood than the other lobes because it is less accessible to testing and living subjects, but it apparently plays roles in understanding spoken language in the sense of taste and in integrating sensory information from visceral receptors. The basal nuclei The basal nuclei are masses of cerebral gray matter buried deep in the white matter, lateral to the thalamus. They are often called basal ganglia, but the word ganglion is best restricted to clusters of neuron outside the CNS. Neuroanatomists disagree on how many brain centers to classify as basal nuclei, but agree on at least... Now, let's hop into the spinal meninges. The term meninges comes from the Greek for membrane and refers to three membranes that surround the brain and the spinal cord, which is the dura mater, the arachnoid matter, and the pia mater. The meninges protect and provide structural support for the brain as well as contain cerebrospinal fluid. The outermost layer of the meninges is the dura mater, which literally means hard mother. This thick and tough layer adheres to the skull on one side and the arachnoid matter on the other side. The dura provides the brain and spinal cord with an extra protective layer attaches the brain to the skull and the spinal cord to the vertebral column to keep them from being jostled around, and provides a system of venous drainage through which blood can leave the brain. The arachnoid matter gets its name because it has the consistency and appearance of a cobweb. It is much less substantial than the dura. Strands of connective tissue called arachnoid trabeculae stretch between the arachnoid and pia matter. These help to suspend the brain in place. Between the arachnoid and pia matter, there is also an area known as subarachnoid space, which is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. The pia matter is a thin layer that closely follows the contours of the brain. It forms a tight membrane around the brain and spinal cord, acting as an additional barrier and aiding in the secretion and containment of cerebrospinal fluid. Blood vessels are held against the pia matter by connective tissue before they penetrate the brain. There is a space between the dura of the spinal cord and the bone of the vertebral column known as the epidural space. Analgesics and anesthesia are sometimes administered here. Also, the dura and arachnoid matter extend several vertebrae below the end of the spinal cord, creating a cerebrospinal fluid-filled area called the lumbar cistern, where there is no spinal cord present. Cerebrospinal fluid can be withdrawn from here because a needle can be inserted with little risk of damaging the spinal cord. Thus, the lumbar system is the site where cerebrospinal fluid is aspirated in a lumbar puncture, also known as a spinal tap. This is done, for example, to diagnose meningitis, a potentially life-threatening inflammation of the meninges.
and we've reached the end of the central nervous system. We hope you learned something along the way. Your next stop will be the peripheral nervous system. Good luck on your journey! Wait! Which way is the peripheral nervous system? Right! There! Let's go! parts of the body's nervous system. It contains nerves that branch out from the brain and spinal cord. Most of your senses are fed information by your PNS. It carries the signals that let you move your muscles. Your PNS also transmits signals to your brain which utilizes them to regulate vital involuntary functions like breathing and heartbeat. It is subdivided into two parts namely the somatic and autonomic nervous systems. Let us now proceed to the first classification of the peripheral nervous system, which is the somatic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is the voluntary part of the PNS and is made up of sensory neurons that carries information inward and motor neurons that carries information outward. Sensory neurons send information from our sensory organs. to the CNS for processing. The CNS sends messages back to our skeletal muscles through motor neurons, allowing for voluntary and reflexive movements. In addition to this voluntary action, this division is also responsible for an involuntary muscle response called reflex arcs. This is an extremely quick muscular contraction in response to a stimulus but with minimal brain intervention. The spinal nerves. It connects the CNS to sensory receptors, muscles, and glands of the body. It is considered part of the peripheral nervous system. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Anterior and posterior roots attach a spinal nerve to a segment of the spinal cord. Let us take a closer look in the individual parts of the spinal nerve. We will find that there are 8 pairs of cervical nerves, 12 pairs of thoracic nerves, 5 pairs of lumbar nerves, 5 pairs of sacral nerves, and a pair of coccygeal nerves. These different names correspond to the vertebrae, where the spinal nerves exit from the intervertebral foramina. We can see here the anatomy of the spinal nerves and let us start from the connective tissue layers that cover them. We will find that there are three main connective tissue layers. First is the epineurium, which is going to surround the entire nerve. Inside we have bundles of axons known as fascicles. The connective tissue layer covering the fascicles is known as perineurium. and each individual axon contains a connective tissue covering called endoneurium. Along with the spinal nerves, as they exit from the intervertebral foramen, the spinal nerve is going to divide into several branches known as rami. First is the dorsal rami, which serves as the dorsal portion of the trunk and goes toward the posterior portion of the body. Next is the ventral rami, which serves as the ventral portion or anterior portion of the trunk and upper or lower limbs. Also, we have meningeal branches. These branches from the spinal nerves go from the spinal nerve and then re-enter back to the spinal cord through the intervertebral foramen. These supply the vertebrae, the vertebral ligaments blood vessels of the spinal cord, and the meninges. And then lastly, for the autonomic nervous system, we have the rami communicants. These are going to contain our autonomic nerves. 
The cervical plexus is formed by the ventral rami of the C1 to C5 nerve roots and innervates the diaphragm, provides motor supply to some neck muscles, and cutaneous sensation to the skin of head, neck, and chest. The brachial plexus is a complex neural network formed by lower cervical and upper thoracic ventral nerve roots, which supplies motor and sensory innervation to the upper limb and pectoral girdle. The lumbar plexus is a complex neural network formed by the lower thoracic lumbar ventral nerve roots T12 to L5, which supplies motor and sensory innervation to the lower limb and pelvic girdle. The sacral plexus is a nerve plexus that provides motor and sensory nerves for the posterior thigh, most of the lower leg, the entire foot, and part of the pelvis. The coccygeal plexus is formed by anterior rami of S4 to S5 in combination with the coccygeal nerve and is described as supplying the skin of the post-anal region. So now let's talk about the cranial nerves. But first, what are the cranial nerves? Cranial nerves are nerves that come from the brainstem or the brain. There are actually 12 different cranial nerves that we have and each of these cranial nerves is going to be paired and present on both sides of the body. It is designated with Roman numerals 1 to 12 to indicate the order of how it appeared in the brain from anterior to posterior direction. The first two arise from the cerebrum while the remaining 10 arise from the brainstem. It leaves the skull through an opening at the base of the skull to be distributed in the muscles and sense organs located in the head and neck region. Cranial nerves are classified according to their types which are sensory, motor, or mixed composition. Afferent are sensory neurons which are carrying signals from various sensory stimuli back toward the brain, while efferent is motor neurons that are going to be carrying away from the brain. Let's now focus on the different cranial nerves. The first nerve we're gonna begin with is the cranial nerve 1 or the olfactory nerve, which originated from our cerebrum. It is a sensory neuron that is responsible for our olfaction or our sense of smell. The next one is the cranial nerve 2 or the optic nerve, which originated from the cerebrum. Just like the first nerve, it is also a sensory neuron that is responsible for vision or the ability to see. Next is the cranial nerve 3 or oculomotor nerve from the midbrain, which is strictly a motor neuron that is responsible for the ability to move and blink the eyes. Cranial nerve 5 or trochlear nerve originated from the midbrain, which is a motor neuron that is responsible for the ability to move the eyes up or down and back and forth. Cranial nerve 7 or the facial nerve originated from the pons. It is both a sensory neuron and a motor neuron. It is a sensory neuron because it is responsible for facial sensation and sensation of the tongue. It is a motor neuron because it is responsible for mastication. It is divided into three parts namely ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. Cranial nerve 6 or the abducens nerve originated from the pontomedullary region. It is a motor neuron that is responsible for the ability to move the eyes. Cranial nerve 7 or the facial nerve originated from the pontomedullary region. It is both a sensory neuron and a motor neuron. It is a sensory neuron that deals with the taste on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. And when it comes to the motor neuron, it deals with facial expression, eyelid closing, salivation, and lacrimation. Next one is the cranial nerve 8 or the vestibule lococcular nerve, which originated from the pontomedullary region. It is a sensory neuron responsible for the sense of hearing and balance. 
for cranial nerve 9 or the glossopharyngeal nerve originated from the medulla oblongata. It is a sensory and motor neuron. Sensory neurons deal with the taste of the posterior one-third of the tongue and the sensation of pharynx also gets input from our sinus, carotid, and chemoreceptors. While the motor function of this nerve is muscles needed for swallowing also helps in our salivation. Next is the cranial nerve 10 or the vagus nerve, which originated on the medulla oblongata. It is a sensory neuron that deals with sensation from the skin around the ear. Also in pharynx, larynx, thorax, and abdomen. It also deals with the taste or sensation in the epiglottis. For the motor function, it is responsible for swallow, speech, and cough. Cranial nerve 11 or accessory nerve originated from the medulla oblongata as well as the cervical spinal cord. It is a motor neuron responsible for the head and neck movement. Lastly, cranial nerve 12 or the hypoglossal nerve originated from the medulla oblongata is a motor neuron responsible for the movement of the tongue. Now, let's dive into another topic under the PNS or the peripheral nervous system. Introducing the autonomic nervous system. Are you ready to find out more about this autonomic nervous system? Let's go! This part of the PNS is responsible for regulating your internal organs like your stomach and heart. It is related to the involuntary body functions. One thing to know about the autonomic system is that it lacks consistency. The effects it provides are muscles, organs, and glands are known to be inconsistent. It is constantly making fine-tuned adjustments to your body depending on what signals your nervous system is picking up, some of which are blood flow, heartbeat, digestion, and breathing. Now, to go further into this topic, remember that the autonomic nervous system has two competing interests that serve the same organs, but create opposite effects towards the body. The two systems in the autonomic nervous system is the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. These battle out in the body to take control of what you are feeling at the moment. It can either amp you up to prepare you for an activity or calm you down and undo what your prior system had constructed. Now come join me to put these into more detail. Firstly, we have the sympathetic system or known as the internal alarm. This system is synonymous with what we all know as stress. This system's neurotransmitter is norepinephrine, which works to have a stimulating effect on the body. More so, the sympathetic system regulates the fight or flight responses in the body. This part of the system composes the body to extend its energy and tend to possible threats found in the body. Meaning, it allows the body to respond quickly in situations that require immediate response. The fibers found in the sympathetic system are what we call thoracolumbar, meaning they situate between our thoracic vertebrae and lumbar vertebrae. Unlike the sympathetic system, parasympathetic is in charge of the calming nerves. It aids in the maintenance of normal bodily functions and the conservation of physical resources. Once a threat has passed, this system will slow the heart rate, breathing rate, blood flow, and pupils constrict. This allows us to return to a normal resting state for our bodies. More so, the fibers found in the parasympathetic system is what we call craniosacral because it emerges between the brainstem and the sacral region of the spinal cord. This division restores the body to a calm and composed state while preventing overwork, which is why it is also known as the rest and digest system. The parasympathetic division's action is the inverse of the sympathetic division's action. Two of their functions are an antagonistic. They harmoniously coordinate in the body to function properly. The neuromuscular junction is a synaptic connection between the terminal end of a motor nerve and a muscle. It serves as a site for the transmission of potential action from nerves to muscle. 
more so, it is common to be sites for various diseases. There are actually three main parts in the NMJ. We have the presynaptic and postsynaptic terminals, and then the area between the nerve and the motor plate, also known as the synaptic cleft. Let's start with the presynaptic terminal. The presynaptic terminal, it is an axonal terminal of motor neurons. It contains numerous synaptic vesicles and they contain the neurotransmitters that are released upon receiving nerve impulse. Nextly, we have the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft, it is the space between the presynaptic and postsynaptic terminals. The synaptic cleft allows the neurotransmitters to reach the other side of the synapse. It contains enzymes for the degrade Degradation, degradation. Lastly, we have the postsynaptic terminal. It is the neuromuscular junction known as the skeletal muscle fiber. The motor neurons make synapses on the sarcolemma. Now, the sarcolemma is the membrane of the skeletal muscle fiber. The sarcolemma shows a number of invaginations called postjunctional folds. These highly increase the surface area for the neurotransmitters to act. Hi again everyone! I heard that you went through the peripheral nervous system. Did you learn anything from Seti's adventure? We are so close to meeting Mr. Brain. But before anything else, remember to be on a lookout for someone dangerous. Be careful on your mission, okay? Oh no! It's Swiper! <laughs> I know what they're trying to do. I will never let you go to Mr. Brain, unless you answer my question correctly. Yeah! yeah. 